So before um, we get started tonight, I want to recognize um, some officials that are here this evening. We have Council Member Dave Thune. <laughs> Council Member Russ Stark. <laughs> Council Member Kathy Lantry. <laughs> Council Member Chris Tolbert. Council Member Amy Brenmon. Yeah. Council Member Dan Bonstrom. Police Chief Tom Smith, West Side. And finally, um, I would like to welcome Mayor Chris Coleman, who is also um, a West Sider and used to participate in our organization and so he would like to say a few words. Good evening everyone. I, yes, that is true, I'm a West Sider, District 3, but uh, I cut my teeth in District 7, uh, working alongside uh, neighbors in the Frogtown area to try to do all these things that we talked about on the screen here and all that. Uh, those of you who know me know uh, a lot of that history. But I was reminded of, of even some of the, the prehistory to my involvement in the District Council. Uh, this, I think it was this morning's paper, they were talking about Molly O'Rourke getting a job as the administrator in Washington County. And Molly uh, being part of that great malaise, what did they call it? The, uh, um, the, the Battle of the Faust or something like that. There was, some, there was some fancy, I can't remember, I'm blanking on it. But uh, where it was the neighborhood group celebrating the last final days of the, of the pornography on the corner of University and, and uh, Dale and the kind of the battle that ensued uh, as, uh, as the neighborhood finally realized victory in all of their efforts to, clear, to clean up that neighborhood. And as I said in the video, it was such an amazing thing to see the transformation of that. Uh, from uh, dirty bookstores and strip clubs to uh, eventually a police substation, which was always kind of a funny little transition uh, period that a strip club became a police station. Um, but, you know, that wasn't, my, that wasn't my thinking. I don't know what happened there. Uh, but now, now you drive by that corner, and not only do you see, on any given day, you see the kids that are lined up to go into uh, an out-of-school time program, uh, maybe uh, lined up on a Saturday morning to go to a reading program or just to have access to a computer. Uh, there are people that are going in there on a daily basis to look for jobs, uh, to take advantage of the incredible services that the library has to, off has to offer. And then you walk out and you look kitty corner from the library and you see that new development there. Uh, you see the new housing for seniors. You see the new opportunities for small business owners on that court or uh, to really be able to take advantage of that. That was the work of the district council. That was the work of the citizens in our community that said there has to be a better vision. There has to be something else that we can do. There has to be, uh, uh, we have to have more of a sense of who we are as a community. Uh, that is the wonder of the district councils. You know, of, of all the discussion that we have, of all the frustration that we have with the federal government uh, and their inability to do anything, the frustration that we have with the state government and sometimes their inability to do anything, the one thing that can be counted on is that on a local level, we get things done. In partnership uh, with the city council that, has, that can help understand and translate the visions of the residents of our, of our community, that can help push through the unique uh, needs of their neighborhood, whether it's a new full-scale grocery store in downtown, or really sustainable development along the central corridor, or a grand vision for the Ford, uh, Ford site in Highland Park. All of these things are really coming together because of the vision that you have and how we work hand in glove with the city council and with the, uh, with the city administration, et cetera, to get these things done. But it all begins with you. It all begins with faith in your community. It all be begins with a love for the city of St. Paul uh, and a willingness to, uh, to not just sit back and complain, but actually get out there, go to the meetings, let your voices be heard, and get things done. So I want to thank you. I want to uh, congratulate you. This is for all the uh, awardees and honorees tonight. Congratulations. Uh, it's always great for us to pause and just recognize the heroes and sheroes of our, of our community. So congratulations. Thank you so much for the work that you do. Let's keep moving St. Paul forward because we've got a lot of work to do. I now have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker for tonight. Um, Jane McClure is a community journalist, she's an author, she's a historian, um, she has edited 
many um, neighborhood newspaper, North End, Frogtown, and the West Side, and she currently writes for the Villager and the Midway Monitor. Jane McClure. Good grief, the mayor is tall. Um, <laughs> this kind of reminds me of basketball in Iowa where I played on a team that didn't win any games. I had to move this down here. So anyway, I'm Jane McClure, and my other job, my real job, besides doing history and neighborhood papers, is I edit the statewide disability paper, Access Press, which is why a chair, a chair is coming up here, because I have rheumatoid arthritis, and that's my disability, and these cold days have been kind of interesting. So if you see me kind of on a chair, standing like a stork during this talk, <laughs> that's why. So we're going to talk about some prehistory pre the district council system. And the district council system, as many of you know, began in 1975. But years before that, even in the 19th century, when St. Paul was a young community, neighborhoods and communities would organize. And um, no, I'm not that old, but um, <laughs> it's, it is kind of a fun history. And then as now, it's ordinary people doing extraordinary things. But first, you know, let's talk a little bit about neighborhoods. I'm going to move the podium. Very good. When we talk about history traditionally, and we talk about leadership structures, we tend to kind of talk about the pyramid of leadership, and we kind of have the leaders up here. But when we talk about community history, I like to think of it more as pieces and as kind of interlocking or interconnected circles and circles of leadership. And as St. Paul grew as a community, we had different circles of leadership in every neighborhood of the city in every different ways. And some of this, some of you, well, I'm not saying you're from the 19th century, but some of you might know some of this history, and for some of you, this might be new. But let's do a little background about when the city began. St. Paul got its start in 1812, when Fort Snelling was sighted here after the War of 1812. It's hard to imagine, but we were the westernmost outpost on the frontier. We needed, we needed the fort to protect the fur traders from Native Americans and from PETA protesters, and no, I made the part about the PETA protesters up, but um, we needed the fort to protect you know, new settlement. So we had the fort, the fort was built in 1819. And with Western forts, people would settle around them. We called them squatters, which is not the nicest name in the world, but we called them squatters. Two of our very nice neighborhoods in this part of the city, Highland and Denoyer Park, got their start with squatters. In fact, there's a part of Highland in the Fort Snelling pre-territorial days that was known as Old Rum Town. It was a collection of shanties. So when the Highland people say, we have a pretty nice neighborhood, you say to them, yeah, guys, but yeah, live in old rum town. So <laughs> you can just tell them that. Anyway, we sited the fort here. We built, it was built in 1819. And what used to drive the military absolutely crazy was the squatters. And f military forts had what were called reservations. The boundaries around them were reservations. And they kept expanding the boundary of Fort Snelling and kicking the settlers out and kicking the settlers out. And that's why the original city of St. Paul didn't form around Fort Snelling. It was because people kept getting kicked to the north. Um, what we know today as Marshall Avenue, at one point was the northernmost boundary of the military reserve. And that's why the Highland Mac Groveland area, before it became part of the was reserve township. Anyway, we kept kicking people north and kicking people north, and a small group of settlers finally wound up where downtown St. Paul is, including a gentleman named Pig's Eye Perrant who on his beer label with the old Minnesota Brewing Company looked an awful lot like Dave Thune. <laughs> but, <laughs> in fact, I remember a villager cartoon comparing Pig's Eye Rod to Dave Thune. <laughs> anyway, I'm probably, you know, never going to get my phone calls in the Ward 2 office returned again for that one. <laughs> Anyway, the settlers were referred to the settlement as Pig's Eye. Pig's Eye brewed and sold whiskey for the soldiers and basically drove the military crazy at Fort Snelling. So they called the community Pig's Eye. Well, people didn't like that. So the Diocese of Dubuque sent Father Lucien Gaultier here to 
work with the settlers, and he ended up renaming the city, Saint, the, well, more what became the city, St. Paul, because Mendota was St. Peter at the time, so we had St. Peter and St. Paul. The interesting story about Lucy and Galtier, not only that they you know, named a failed retail development after him, but <laughs> he was in the wrong district. He was from Diocese of Dubuque, which was, Wisconsin, you know, which was Iowa territory at the time. And a shout out to all the fellow Iowans, that's where I'm from. Actually, the, the other side of the river, where downtown St. Paul is and where the village began, was in the Diocese of Milwaukee. So, yeah, <laughs> little jurisdictional issue there from 1841, but that's okay. Anyway, we founded the city, they built the Log Chapel. The sad side story about the Log Chapel, where Kellogg Park is now, is it was dismantled and put up by the old St. Joseph's Academy, now Christ Household of Faith. The chapel logs were preserved with the idea that it was gonna be erected again, but in the late 19th century, some workers there got cold, they burned the logs. So <laughs> there is no more chapel of St. Paul. Anyway, we founded the city. The city grew from around downtown. We had Irvin Park, Dayton's Bluff, Railroad Island, Ramsey Hill, which was known as St. Anthony Hill because it was the road to St. Anthony Village passed through it. The neighborhoods formed Frogtown. Lower Town we think of as converted warehouses. At one time it was a fashionable residential neighborhood. Good place to live. Lafayette Park, Williams Hill. In 1858, the West Side became part of St. Paul. We got the West Side in a swap with Dakota County. We had the St. Paul Bridge, and, the far and there were tolls to cross the bridge. And the farmers in Dakota County didn't want to pay the tolls. People on the west side, who, what's now the west side, didn't want to go to you know, pay the toll to cross, you know, to go to church, to shop in the village of St. Paul. And so there was a lot of debate about that. The church of St. Michael, St. Michael's Catholic Church, which is now the tower for Torre de San Miguel on the west side, was supposedly started because the west side Irish were too cheap to pay the tolls to cross the river. <laughs> So we essentially had a vote in Ramsey and Dakota counties to swap the west side to the city of St. Paul because the original city of West St. Paul, which was there, had gone broke because of flooding and doing things like printing their own money, which is bad. And city council, listen to that. That's not a good idea to balance the budget. Um, <laughs> anyway, we had the vote. I believe I have the date here. November 3rd, 1874. We had the vote and... Dakota County gave Ramsey County and St. Paul the west side and the bridge tolls were lifted. The quick note is you notice the little notch on the city border and some of the Ames school kids called me about that a few years ago and said, why is there a notch? Well, when the west side was given to Ramsey County and St. Paul, the Dakota County Superintendent of Schools lived there and you can't be the Dakota County Superintendent of Schools if you live in Ramsey County. <laughs> so they put a notch in the border, and that is what is called the 40 acres. <laughs> so the neighborhoods continued to grow. We, the west side became part of St. Paul. We began to see neighborhoods develop their own identity. We added Hazel Park, Highwood. We added Hamlin, McAllister, and Groveland, which in those days were known as two distinct neighborhoods. Highland was still farm country then. Como Park, St. Anthony Park. Highwood Hills, the neighborhoods started to grow and the city started to fill in. And as neighborhoods grew, neighborhoods developed their own identities and neighborhoods began to organize. And one of the best ways, if you're curious about how neighborhoods would organize, look at the old neighborhood papers and look at the old daily papers like the Pioneer, the Pioneer Press, the Daily News, and the Globe, etc. Because they all had social news columns from the neighborhoods, like, you know, Jimmy Jones from South St. Anthony Park is going to the University of Minnesota, or Mr. and Mrs. Smith from Hamlin neighborhood motored to Red Wing. Um, <laughs> I remember being about eight years old and reading a history and saying, what does motored mean? And my dad said it meant drive, and I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> big deal to have a car and drive to Red Wing. But more importantly than reading the social news and who was doing what to whom, was how you learned how neighborhoods organized and changed. And when you read the old papers and the old social columns, you really do learn the history of a community. And you learn, more importantly, how that community grew and changed. And it's interesting when you look back and you see what groups were active in each area 
Um, and you had a number of groups that organized. One of the big factors was neighborhood schools and parochial schools and the mother's clubs. We often hear, you know, people think, oh, the mother's club, they were knitting mittens. They were making brownies. And no, mother's clubs were a huge force in this city. Some of our schools were real dumps. Um, you hear about Cleveland School in the Payne Phelan neighborhood, which actually burned one night. You hear about Gutterson School in St. Anthony Park, which a friend of mine went to as a child, and she says, yeah, I loved it, but it was not a safe school. There could have been a fire. Mother's clubs really helped organize the schools. In 1946, we had the first ever teacher strike in the country in St. Paul, and it was the mother's clubs who helped, you know, keep the teachers on the picket line, brought them coffee, brought them into their houses to warm up. The mother's clubs actually worked on fundraising. Until the 1960s, our schools were run by the city. And there was always, if you read some of the teacher histories, you'll read about, you know, having to tear the paper towels in half so the kids would each get half a towel to dry their hands. And it was the mother's clubs who had to lobby for the school improvements, the stop signs, and the school nursing program. And they provided the leadership in neighborhoods. One reason we don't have an interchange at I-94 and prior is because the mother's club and the priest at St. Mark's, the mother's clubs from Longfellow School in St. Mark's and the priest from St. Mark's threatened to go out in the 60s and lay down in front of the bulldozers before the interchange was built. So needless to say, we don't have the interchange there. Another way, religious institutions were also how neighborhoods organized. They neighbor, around your parish, parishes would have clubs that would do civic projects and would work on things. We also had settlement houses. Settlement houses were a big part of the city history. We often think of neighborhood house, but we have many social service agencies that began as settlement houses. And settlement houses grew out of the 19th century progressive era. And that was in response to the growing number of immigrants in this country. Neighborhood House was formed by the women of Mount Zion Temple after two trainloads of impoverished East European Jews were kind of dumped here. They were fleeing the pogroms of Eastern Europe. And the, the, you know, the railroad companies would bring them as far as the money took them. And here they were. Um, so that's how Neighborhood House got started. Christ Child Center, 1911. East Side. I don't expect any of you to remember that or else you'd be really, really old. But that is the predecessor to Merrick Community Services. Groups like Merrick did a lot. Merrick, that started to assist Italian immigrants in the Swede Hollow and in part in the West End's Upper Levy neighborhood. So settlement houses were huge and they would organize people. We had Central Community House on East University Avenue. We had Capital Community Services in the North End. We had Halle Q. Brown, which organized the African American community in the Frogtown and the Summit U neighborhoods. So we had all that kind of organizing to do with settlement houses. And they would organize in a way that was kind of fun. And it kind of strikes us as quaint now, but they would do clubs. And you'd have a mother's club, the father's club, and the kids would all have clubs. And if you read about Neighborhood House, one of the more colorful clubs was you know, a bunch of teenage boys who decided their name should be the gang from the underworld. And I've been waiting for one of the district councils to name itself that. Um, you might get more press that way. But <laughs> the gang from the underworld eventually changed its name to the Young Citizens. But that was also how we organized community. <laughs> and we got things done. And you might ask, why were these groups so important? Well, it's because we didn't have city council wards here until the 1970s. We had the city divided into wards, but we elected people on a citywide basis. And if you didn't have a group to organize for you, you would kind of, you know, you'd kind of get the shaft. Another way neighborhoods organized, and we're going to give a shout out tonight to one of the awardees, is North, you know, improvement clubs. And North End Improvement Club is here some of their representatives. We also had improvement clubs and betterment clubs in most neighborhoods, Hamlin, Dayton's Bluff, Frogtown, McAllister. There were probably half a dozen of them on the east side alone. And improvement clubs were really important because they were the ones who lobbied for things. And street paving, we had cinder and dirt streets. We had streetcar lines that didn't reach some of the neighborhoods. People really needed to organize and get around those things, and improvement clubs and betterment clubs would help them do things. Larger groups, like the Midway Chamber, which began almost 90 years ago as the Midway Club, would sometimes be umbrella groups for these smaller groups, and they would help them organize as well. Um, 
One of the interesting projects the Midway Chamber worked on, and I used to fool people when I did the Highland History Tour, I would say, who brought the Ford plant to Highland? What business group? And they'd all say, Highland Business Association. And I'd say, no, it was the Midway Chamber. Because their territory at that time extended all the way down to Montreal Avenue. So that was another way neighborhoods organized and changed. But again, a little shout out to North End Improvement Club. It's kind of an interesting group, one of the few of the improvement clubs left. They date from 1922. And they worked on issues including the early versions of the Rice Street Festival, which began as a harvest festival. They worked to get streets paved in the North End. They worked to get Washington School built. And they worked with other improvement clubs around the city to build Washington, Wilson, Marshall, and Monroe. And that's how the schools got built. One of the more interesting projects North End Improvement Club did was get McCarran's Lake turned into a county park, even though it's not you know, technically in the city of St. Paul, we'll overlook that small detail. But um, they worked very hard to get the park created, and that was how the park began. So you had the improvement clubs that did all kinds of things, and the improvement clubs were how you had cloud at the city. People would also organize by ethnic group. In the days before we had insurance, we had benevolent associations that different immigrants would run, we had, we had cultural centers, the, probably the only surviving old cultural center in the city is the CSPS Hall, the Polish Hall and Arcade is no more, unfortunately. And we had a beautiful old German Hall on Lower Rice Street that is long gone. But people would organize in that way because we didn't have health insurance, we didn't have burial insurance, we didn't have money to help families. So it was important to have the benevolent associations. People also organized because frankly they were excluded. You look at the history of the African American community in St. Paul. You look at the Sterling Club. You look at Credifon, which ran a credit union, which was a social club. People formed groups because they weren't allowed in other groups. And that's how you develop leadership within your own community. And then when you had enough people, you'd have a strong enough voice to go to the policymakers and say, hey, this is what you want, this is what you need. The other interesting thing is that the organizations continued to grow and change into the 19th century leading up to the district council formation. And at times, specifically in about 1916 and the 1930s, groups would get together on a citywide basis. There was a civic league in St. Paul that formed in 1916, and one of the issues they worked on was the fact that the city had, wait for it, too many billboards. <laughs> There was another neighborhood association of neighborhood groups around the city in the 1930s. One of their issues, and I'm sure the Summit Hill people will appreciate this, too many chain stores. <laughs> Keep the chain stores out of St. Paul. So you had groups that would organize and organize all the other groups and get them together from time to time. We also had groups that would organize socially, and they would organize around things like the Winter Carnival. Every neighborhood had a carnival club. Frogtown, if you ever see the Frogtown history brochure put out by Historic St. Paul, you'll see a tiny frog on the cover. He's my clicker. He's from the old Frogtown Winter Carnival marching group from the 1950s, and he does click very loudly, but he's very old, and when we were putting the history brochure together, I had to keep taking him away from the Historic St. Paul people. They're like, ooh, we like to play with him, and I'm like, no, guys, he's old. He's, a, he's older than me, so <laughs> be nice to the frog. But you had people who organized around that. And in the 60s, when we had urban renewal, and the 70s, people began to organize. We had groups that organized with model cities. We had groups like, anybody remember NECO, North End Community Association, organization, sorry, that would have been NECA. Or the PAC, the Phelan Area Community Council, which we need to give a shout out to. Phelan Area Community Council formed in 1965 and was active into the early 90s. That was a group that ran a newspaper called the East Cider. They ran a food shelf, and they ran many social services and community programs, and they helped organize residents in the Payne Phelan neighborhood. So you have all those groups that organized up into the formation of the district council system. And some fun facts on the council organization before I wrap up here and take a few questions. When the district council system was formed, the powers that be thought we were gonna have one district council per city council ward. 
Well, it didn't work because many groups came in. And in my neighborhood, I'm a resident of District 13, Merriam Park, my neighborhood had three pre-existing neighborhood organizations. So we had three councils in one district for a long time because the, you, know, you had existing neighborhood groups that had formed. Lexington Hamlin Community Council, one of the oldest groups in the city, formed in part because there were concerns about Ide Mill Road expansion and freeway expansion. Another group that deserves a shout out, and though, although they religiously boycott this event, is the West End and RIP 35E, the citizens group that formed out of concern for the expansion of 35E through the neighborhoods. And every year it seems some suburban legislator will decide to raise the speed limit and I get a, I'll get a frantic call from the West 7th Federation office, quick, quick, do you have a copy of the legal settlement? And I'm like, yes, yes I do, but you need to copy it. <laughs> I remember taking multiple copies to Betty Moran once and saying, do not lose these. <laughs> but you get groups like that, and again, it's a history of extraordinary things done by ordinary people, like yourselves. And congratulations to the award winners, and I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Jane. That was a great history. And that's really what we're here to celebrate tonight is the history of St. Paul and the people that make it a great city. Um, I've had, I've worked now in St. Paul only for about a year. I'm a South Minneapolis girl, boo. But I have had the opportunity to work with some amazing people on the west side. And I think that the district council system in St. Paul is an amazing thing. And so you are all wonderful people. I am going to welcome to the mic now Council President Kathy Lantry, who is going to um, do the awards. Thank you very much. Um, before I get started, um, we actually passed, the City Council passed a resolution on Wednesday, which is part of my duties tonight. I have to read it. And um, it's sort of nice because I get asked to come and do this every year, and I have established that it's because I'm a really good reader. So um, let's see how I do tonight. Um, so this passed on Wednesday, and it is sort of a nice wrap-up. Um, everybody's going to make lots of comments and whatnot, but I think that the resolution that we passed really puts into words sort of how strongly all of us feel about the work that everyone in this room does every single day without getting paid a cent. So this is a, um, a really small opportunity for us to say thank you. So here's what passed on Wednesday. Celebrating St. Paul District Council's 2011 Neighborhood Honor Roll Volunteer Awards Night on Friday, January 20th, 2012. Nice little short, succinct title. Okay, whereas the city of St. Paul officially established a citywide community participation process by council resolution in October 1975, whereas for more than 35 years, the citywide community participation process has relied upon St. Paul's 17 district councils to facilitate effective, informed, and representative participation of neighborhoods in government, whereas St. Paul's district councils are community-based organizations that identify neighborhood needs, initiate community programs to meet these needs, and recruit neighborhood volunteers to carry out these programs. Whereas the neighborhood honor roll has become the means for the city of St. Paul and the district council organizations to recognize the significant work of neighborhood volunteers and the value they bring to our community. Whereas the St. Paul District Councils are hosting an event on January 20th, 2012 to recognize the efforts of neighborhood volunteers during 2011 and to name new volunteers to the neighborhood honor roll, now therefore be it resolved that the St. Paul City Council recognizes St. Paul's 17 District Councils for their work in ensuring community participation in St. Paul's planning and decision making processes and be it further resolved that the St. Paul, St. Paul City Council commends the volunteers recognized as part of the St. Paul District Council's 2011 Neighborhood Honor Roll Volunteer Awards Night and thanks them for their efforts to make their neighborhoods great places to live, work, and play. So. Elena's going to take that home and frame it. Okay, so okay, um, here here's the deal. I I, I get I do get a, a chance to sort of read off everybody's names, and every year I always feel like we ought to have rehearsal, and then of course I never do. So we just sort of wing it, 
And um, there's a lot of clapping and it's out of order and everyone is, is um, welcome to come up as soon as they hear their name. Um, and I'm also gonna ask that my colleagues, whoever represents um, the different district councils, and we'll start off with me because I'm already up here, um, just come up and so it's an opportunity for our council members to thank personally all of our volunteers. So, um, and, it, and it, you know, I represent Ward 7, I'm always last on everything. Except I represent District 1 Community Council, so I'm first. <laughs> so um, here are here is our um, our outstanding volunteers of 2011. And our first volunteer, oh, this is so oh, wait till you see these. These are totally beautiful, I have to say. Um, so I better not touch it, I'm sure I'll mess it up. Okay, our first, our first honoree is Phil Fuhrer. Phil, come on up. When District 1 faced the realization six years ago that it could no longer afford to publish its newspaper monthly and it couldn't afford to pay staff to put it together, Phil stepped forward to keep the institution alive as a volunteer. He single-handedly produces the District 1 news three times a year. He gives up his free time to keep 12,000 households informed about their local neighborhood news. Okay, and ironically, Phil and I ran against each other twice. And, and, I, and by the way, he is, it really is an honor to give him the award because he was, is, and I, I'm sure always will be an incredible volunteer for our neighborhood. So everybody finds a way to, to work with us. So congratulations to Phil. Next is Tanya Smith. <laughs> I love that extra clapping. Tanya brought her own cheering section, so let that be a note to everyone else. <laughs> Tanya has been described as a quiet hero who does what needs to be done without seeking credit. We are happy to give her credit here. She is a 3M engineer and a mother of two daughters. She volunteers with the Girl Scouts and with her PTA. She teaches Sunday school and is a member of the Progressive Baptist Education Ministry. Tanya sets high standards for herself and the young people to whom she's dedicated. Oh, that's right, I forget. I have to work to do here, so I can't be chatting. We'll do that later. Okay. Um, Jeff Welly. Okay, I've known Jeff forever, so I should have read this beforehand because I'm sure I have all sorts of things to say. I write all sorts of things to say about this. Um, Jeff is another can-do neighbor, I would agree with that, by the way, who knows how to step up and get the job done. Although new to this part of the neighborhood, since when? How long? I've lived there my whole life. Okay, well, then, well. <laughs> I hate to move here. <laughs> that's right. When the county cut funding for keeping, oh yeah, no kidding, for, I should have read this before, for keeping the open space mowed along Battle Creek, Jeff started mowing the area himself. And by the way, you should drive by this. I mean, I think people think it's a boulevard. It's gigantic. I, I've seen him mowing it. It's a really big spot. It's a tough job. Jeff started mowing the entire area himself, often twice a week. Jeff's stewardship improves the neighborhood for residents, walkers, dog owners, and ball players who appreciate this trailside space. Okay, so that's District 1. We're done with District 1. Now we're on to District 2. Councilmember Bostrom. Oh, yeah, Councilmember Bostrom. Yeah, I'll help you. Okay. And the honoree in District 2 is Joanne Clausen. As a longtime East Side resident, Joanne has been nominated to the honor roll to recognize her ongoing commitment to preserve historic housing in the District 2 area. Joanne has worked to have the Ames House recognized as being home to William Ames, who played a large part in St. Paul's early school system and real estate development. Joanne is also a block leader and frequent volunteer for the Northeast Neighborhoods Block Nursing Program. Congratulations. Oh, I should have you give that. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. 
Okay, sorry, Dan, I'll call you back up in a little bit. Sorry. Okay, and now we're going to do District 3. Roxanne Young. Oh, she, she sat nice up front, nice and close. Good, so you don't have to make that long walk. Roxanne has been an exemplary leader on the West Side. Her many contributions include serving as a board member for the West Side Community Organization, leading initiatives to increase public art in the neighborhood, spearheading a community garden, and using her knowledge of the real estate market to find Wesco a new office. Her contributions to the West Side community are numerous, and we are grateful for her support. Congratulations. Congratulations, Roxanne. Thank you for all your work. Okay, Dave, you can't sit down yet. Because you have, oh, except they're absent. So right. you're uh, accepting on behalf of, of Grit, Youngquist, and John Kerr will be Council Member Thune, okay? And, but we still, we're still going to hear about them, and then we can say that we, we said nice things about them and everyone clapped for them. He's even in Nicaragua, in, so we'll, we'll oh, he's in Nic him. Oh, he's we'll in not Nicaragua? Okay, you hang on to those. Let's, let's hear what Grit and John did. They have been instrumental in supporting the people and ecology of the West Side in multiple ways from their environmental work with Friends of Lilydale to the creation of FAB, oh, I love that acronym, which stands for Friends and Amigos of Baker. Oh, very cute. Grit and John have demonstrated true leadership and initiative in their efforts to support the assets of the West Side. The West Side truly appreciates their many contributions. So. District four, okay, that's me. I'm already here, okay. Eric and Amy Buck. The Bucks give all of their resources, time, money, love, sweat, etc. They help start and staff a program wherein young workers do odd jobs for homeowners in Dayton's Bluff. They are involved with the Dayton's Bluff Early Childhood Family Education, founded the Reading Rodeos Program, an after-school remedial reading, reading curriculum, Boy Scouts, and Mounds Theater. There are so many good things that this unassuming family does. They are an inspiration to all of us. Oh, I see. It's so beautiful. It's so true, too. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I know, I just have to say, all these people, I feel wholly inadequate. Like, what am I doing with my time? These people have like a long darn list. Okay, June Bennett. June did an outstanding job of working with a Dayton's Bluff family of six who lost everything in a house fire, including organizing a donation drive to help. She helps in the Dayton's Bluff Community Council office. June came to us through a senior aid program and worked here from 2005 to 2007. We were very lucky to get her back in 2008, and we hope to keep her until her four-year assignment is complete. June, thank you. Susan Tejan. Susan operates the Assistant Healing Center at 733 East 7th Street. She was the driving force, boy there's an understatement, in restarting the Dayton's Bluff Area Business Association, beginning with the flowering pots in front of 7th Street businesses. She served as president for the first year of the Reformed Association and a key player in the success of the Keys to the Community, an event to help residents learn more about businesses in Dayton's Bluff. Susan. Congratulations. District 5. Okay, so this, I, I, oh, this is probably one of those, it might be one of those double things. So both will have, we'll have both Council Member Bren Moen and Council Member Bostrom. They'll do double duty. And we're going to start with the Westminster Black Club. The West, oh, I know, see, we're, oh, we, okay, we're clapping for the Westminster Black Club because they're so fabulous. Okay. They would feel bad if we went off of our, off kilter here. The Westminster Black Club organized 
uh, to first respond to serious nuisance and problem properties. Their national night out celebration attracts more people each year. They have claimed a vacant lot and, informed, uh, and a former drug house site by planting flowers. Their efforts blossomed as they started up several boulevard gardens along their blocks. They walked the neighborhood on summer nights, picking up litter and greeting their neighbors. They successfully address tough issues and embody being good neighbors to all. Oh. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Okay, if you see them, oops, on the street, don't cross that one. Oh, okay. careful, there's, he's, she snapped up, it's just a piece of paper, right? You know, you don't get anything with it. Duluth Case Booster Club. Yay! The Duluth Case Booster Club goes the extra mile to provide leadership to support children and families who use the Duluth Case Rec Center. This group of dedicated, oh, look at how many there are. Come on, keep coming. I didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't looking up. It's like, yeah, yeah, I know. Okay. The whole right side of the room is now behind me. This group of dedicated residents organize volunteers in a work day to paint the exterior of the building, organize and host large community building events for children in the area, and promote ongoing learning with classes and activities for children. This group demonstrates the value that indeed all children are our children. Congratulations. Thank you to everybody. Okay, this would, we needed to form some sort of conga line to do this, I think. Okay. All right. And uh, Lower East Side Football. For some reason, I thought they'd be taller. I thought I'll notice when the Lower East Side football guys come up. Okay. The Lower East Side football team, or LES, has been actively supporting boys and young men for several decades on the East Side. When faced with problems or loss of resources, they never give up and maintain a strong tradition of moving the community forward. The LES team provides positive role models, leadership, and support for the well-being, accomplishment, and dignity of young Eastsiders and many African-American young men and boys. Oh. Okay, so District 6, Al Norin. Uh, and I forgot to apologize already. Like, is it, is it Norin or is it Noreen? Norin, Norin. It is Norin. Oh, wait. Well, I'm going to goof up a, a name later, so I'm apologizing right now. Al grew up in the Rice Street area. He has been a long-standing member of the Northdale Booster Club and was also a member of the building committee of the Northdale Recreation Center. Al has been flooding the rinks at Northdale since 1985. According to staff at Northdale, quote, without Al, I don't know what we would do here at Northdale. Did you know they said that? That's sort of beautiful. He takes a lot of pride in his work. How great is that? North End Improvement Club. Hey, Jane, Jane chatted about this, so it's like a test. What year were they formed? No, I'm kidding. It was, by the way, it was in the spring of 1922 by citizens of the North End. Its purpose was to foster the growth and prosperity of the neighborhood by advocating to receive capital improvements such as sewers and sidewalks. Over the years, the club made numerous contributions to the North End, at one time being the sole sponsor of the Rice Street Festival. The Improvement Club continues their good work for the North End. <laughs> Kevin Barrett from Dar's Double Scoop. It is a night like this that makes us all think of ice cream, no doubt. Dar's Double Scoop, 
opened in July of 2005, selling coffees and ice cream. Dars sponsors ice cream socials for area schools, clubs, and churches. Kevin has co-sponsored the car show for the last four years and is an active participant in the Rice Street Festival. Dars Double Scoop and owner Kevin Barrett is an asset to Rice Street and our neighborhood. Okay, now we're on to District 7, and I know Council Member Carter is not here, um, oh, but, I, okay. but, Noel, but I was just going to say, but Noel Nix, his Cracker Jack aide, sorry to borrow that from, I know, I'm sorry, Pat. Every, I, I, I know Pat Lindgren thinks that she has some sort of market on Cracker Jack aide. Well, Noel, he's, Noel is, gonna, is going to do the accepting on behalf of Council Member, Member Carter. Okay. All right, so District 7, Sharonda Oridge. Okay, I don't know if Sharon is here, but no. So, for over a decade, Sharonda has been a hardworking on, community man. leader. Oh my God, we're gonna do pictures now? Okay, this is like Wednesday's council meeting. We just, well, you do what you need to, I'll just okay. keep reading, okay? I, <laughs> These pictures, by the way, are not going to be attractive. They're going to be on Facebook. Too. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. What, no video? Okay. Good. All right. Oh. All right. Do you want to hear what you did or not? Oh, yeah. Go okay. Ahead. All right. All right. Do you want? Okay. Maybe I should let her read. All right. Again, another one. These volunteers, you guys have a purpose. For over a decade, Sharonda has be, had been a hardworking community leader. Despite being caught in a predatory loan, Sharonda has not only continued the struggle to stay in her home, but has found the time to co-found the Arts Responding to Foreclosure Project and serves as a key leader in the St. Paul Fair Lending Coalition, fighting to keep neighbors in their homes. She also gives voice to issues through her powerful spoken word pieces. No kidding, right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, you know, our, our poor next person, I don't know, Cassandra Berg, I hope you have a band with you. <laughs> yeah, Cassandra, okay. Okay, all right. Uh, but I hit it. Okay, good. I keep me on task. From the day she moved into Frogtown two years ago, Cassandra has been working for safety on her block. In this short time, she has held meetings, hosted parties, and written several 10 page newsletters. Wordy. If she wasn't enlisting kids to pick up trash, then she was confronting prostitutes and drug dealers. Every extra moment she has is dedicated to improving the quality of life of her family and neighbors in our state capitol's backyard. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can you imagine if her and Sharonda got together? Oh, it would be, it would be chaos. You should make that connection. I have a feeling you could have another award next year. Fran, the grill man, Tessier, and this award is given posthumously, and which always makes me sad because we should have taken the time to do this before. Um, so this is, this is a, a nice way for us to honor Fran. For over 30 years, Fran called Frogtown home. He was an important part of improving Frogtown throughout the 1990s. In the final 10 years of his life, he brought a large grass, gas grill, attached it to a custom fabricated trailer, and attached that to his riding lawnmower. He traveled, I know, can't you just, don't you just love that? I like that visual. He traveled all over Frogtown, and in one case, as far as Como Park. Uh, you supplied the meat, and he did all the cooking. We miss you, Fran. not happy to be up here. Fran received this award about seven years ago. Oh, you know what? Thank you, Tate. Fran did, re we were, you know what? I should have known District 7 would not have missed a beat. Fran did receive the award seven years ago as well. So they did take the time to honor him when he knew about it. 
I know, but now it's, those were great grandchildren, by the way. I said, oh, was that your grandpa? Said, no, great grandpa. Oh my gosh. Okay, I know. So totally beautiful. And we're going to ask Council Member Brent Moen to help us again because we're in District 10, although I think that's shared with Council Member Stark. Thank you, Mr. Nix. Okay, so now District 10, Jean Bauman. Oh, again, right up in front. Jean has been a block leader for over 15 years, connecting neighbors to each other in the West Como Park neighborhood. Jean's, is it Jean or Jeannie? Jean. Jean. Okay, oh good, I didn't go, whoa, yeah, I didn't goof that up. Jean's most notable neighborhood accomplishment is leading a team of neighbors to design and complete a street mural on Albany Avenue. The neighborhood team completed a design contest, raised money, organized supplies, and carried out the Paint the Pavement event. Jean has given so much toward making the neighborhood a great place to live. <laughs> Elaine Allen. <laughs> Elaine is a tireless block club leader sharing district council communications, organizing crime awareness seminars in her home, and orchestrating national night out celebrations, book clubs, chore helps. I, the, by the way, the commas just keep going as I'm reading ahead. Book clubs, chore help, and the alley snowplow effort. Elaine will open her home for informational gatherings, inviting experts on subjects such as safety and local politicians. Ooh, have you guys been there? <laughs> Okay, I'm sure that, okay. Well, here's your invitation. Following her model, other neighbors now do the same. Elaine is a true humanitarian, and as her neighbors say, the glue that holds them together. Oh. It's not official, unless you have the paper. Mike McDonald. <laughs> Mike has been a quiet but effective leader and diligent volunteer in District 10. He chaired the District 10 Environment Committee, obtaining funding for and spearheading rain barrel workshops to promote water conservation and quality. He was active in public garden maintenance, garden tours, tree projects, a Como Lake turtle study, oh, we'll have to hear about that later, lakeshore planting, weeding sessions, and much more. Mike remains an active member of the Environment Committee, also serving on the Capital Region Watershed District's Citizen Advisory Committee. And you're going to stay put because now I'm going to do District 11. Okay. <laughs> Oh no, I no, I, I I can I can go that extra. I know, but it's part foot. of my it's part, it's part of my MC. Gig. Thank you, Vanna. Okay, okay. Pat Van Rees. <laughs> we all appreciate having a helpful neighbor, one who will look after our pets or lend us a tool or help with a home improvement project. Oh, now everyone knows that here. You know that now, Pat? So anyone who lives around him, take note of what he looks like, okay? And Pat is that neighbor. Even more so, we all appreciate having a helpful neighbor in the winter. Oh, no. Oh, geez. One who will help remove our ice dams or take out the snowblower and clear the sidewalk and driveways on the block. And Pat is that neighbor, too. Congratulations. I know. Think about how he earned that in 2011 with having that all the, I, I mean, really. Okay, Kathy Oaks. For the past several years, Kathy has hosted and promoted the Hamlin Midway Barter Market, a, play, a time and place for local residents to swap extra produce, trade homemade goods, exchange used items, or just have a good conversation. Through her generous investment of time and energy, Kathy has advanced the twin ethics of neighborliness and stewardship, stewardship on our planet. Oh. Thank you. Hamlin Midway History Corps. 
that since 2005, the Hamlin Midway History Corps has persistently pursued its mission to collect, share, and preserve the history of the Hamlin Midway neighborhood. Fran, from a popular speaker series to monthly, meeting, to monthly meetups, to archival projects, to advocacy for preservation of historic buildings, the Hamlin Midway History Corps has reminded the neighborhood that the future of a community is always firmly rooted in its past. Oh, okay. Again, Mr. Stark, District 12. Yeah, that's right, he's just gonna stay right here. Tom Bielenberg, Hans Wyant, Macabre's Brewstore, uh, Bookstore, Brewstore. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm channeling. Doesn't, wouldn't it be nice if it were a Brewstore? Oh, right, okay, well don't tell me if it is, that's a licensing issue, but I'm sorry, it's Macabre's Bookstore. Okay, Tom and Hans run one of the most neighborly small businesses in the Twin Cities. They consistently go above and beyond, tirelessly supporting local authors and publishers with readings and nourishing readers and book clubs with discounts and special events. Every year they hold a book sale with all sales benefiting the local elementary school. They represent the ideal independent neighborhood business committed to personal service and being good neighbors and friends to the community. Oh. Twenty-two thirty-eight Carter at Carter and Como. I mean, we should go there. That's a that's a great thing. I mean, we might as well patronize him too. What? Oh, he he. I'm sorry. Hans was not, was Han Tom. Will you make sure Hans gets his paperwork? Okay. Michael Russell. In addition to service on the District Council, he has been a major force in Neighbors for Peace. He is now bringing a sustainability resilience initiative into community discussions. He operates quietly but effectively on important causes ranging from traffic calming to community energy campaigns to federal military policy. He's a Murray Junior High Science Fair judge and installed a PV solar collector on their garage to set a community example without any expectation of recouping the cost. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Fax and Tom Spriegel, Speedy Market. Okay, we'll have to get their address too, so we patronize these guys who we're honoring. What's your address? Huh? 2310 Como. 2310 Como. Oh, when you're at Macabre's. You could stop at Speedy. Yeah, there's okay. A problem. Okay. All right. Tim and Tom, not represented here. No, I'm not Tom. Okay. <laughs> Tom, Tim, and Tim, 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 Tim and Tim. wife Maria. Maria. <laughs> okay. What'd you do with Tom? He's staying home. Oh, Tom isn't here. Okay. So, well, again, make sure he gets the paperwork. Tim and Tom have enthusiastically supported neighborhood events and held numerous community events on their own. For many of our neighborhood's young people, clerking at Tim and Tom's is their first job. Not only do they provide a great selection of groceries at a good price, including organic products, they serve as the social networking spot for St. Anthony Park neighborhood. Every neighborhood should have a Tim and Tom's Speedy Market. Oh. We're gonna have to trust you on that one. Okay, sticking with the theme of Ward 4, District 13. <laughs> Clapping, okay. Darlinda Coe. Darlinda is an active gardener at the Eleanor Graham Community Garden and on the UPDC, what does that stand for again? Union Park District Council, Union Park District Council. sorry. Um, Community Garden Task Force. She also contributed in developing a master plan for the area that included a trail connection to the Triangle Park at Summit and Eidmill Road. Darlinda instituted a system of monthly work days for the 
communal upkeep of the garden and was instrumental in installing the watering system at the Eleanor Graham Community Garden. Darlinda. Oh. Luckily, she does not have to be present to win, and we'll make sure she gets that. Okay. And we have another award that we are awarding posthumously to Rich Wilbur, and it will be um, presented to Lisa Fuller, his daughter. Okay. Rich served as board member and chair of the UPDC Parks and Rec Committee. He was the driving force in the popular ice cream social and helped to develop the Miriam Park Master Plan. Up until the time of his passing, he worked to bring community and committee members together in order to preserve and improve public parks, especially Miriam Park, which he valued as a community gathering place and an important resource for the city. Skyline Tower Leadership Team. Oh, interesting. We have, whole, we, have whole, we have a bunch of extra stuff. I can't wait. We have extra parts. We'll see what it, We'll see if any of those people are here when we're done. Okay. The Skyline Tower Leadership Team has contributed countless hours to improve the community in and around Skyline Tower. They have worked thoughtfully across multiple languages and cultures within Skyline to provide leadership and improve communication within the building. This group created and advocated for the St. Anthony Street Safety Initiative through the complicated, no kidding, CIB process. They are making a meaningful and immeasurable impact on the quality of life in this community. And we've been joined now by Councilmember Tolbert. Okay, and then we're at District 14. Okay, and, and the, the first one is Kids Park Hourly Child Care Transition Team, which is... It's a trio, there's three. Which is the triumvirate of Erica Craig Rude Smith, Carolyn, Carolyn India Black, and Liz Matakis. What is it? I, oh, I was close enough, apparently. Okay, let's hear about it then. Uh, for the, I'm sorry, it's like, no, you can't have it until I've read this. For the, past, for the past year, the Community Council and Kids Park, led by their transition team, have cooperated on making Kids Park an independent organization at their current location. The transition team has had to spend long hours developing a business plan, bolstering family participation, and working through legal and administrative issues on the way to independence, while also maintaining current programs, such as successfully defending a CIB-funded safety fence. Their effort shows every sign of success. <laughs> Leo Victoria. Oh, Victoria. Uh, by the way, and I just said to him I, beforehand, I love that there's a K and not a C, because it's like, just make it a K. Be done with it. <laughs> Victoria. Okay, so Leo, I should have just said, hey, Leo, come and get your award. Uh, Leo is the current treasurer, but has served for many years on the council board. He is best known for his work as our representative to the West Summit Neighborhood Advisory Committee. Leo has led us through difficult issues such as parking and traffic planning around St. Thomas. His attention to detail is legendary, even counting every parking space on campus. Leo led the effort to introduce our car and other improvements to campus. Roy, Ka okay, it says Roy and then Ray. Is it Ray? Ray, sorry. Ray Kata. So sorry. Ray has worked along with the Groveland Booster Club in contributing hundreds of hours each winter season in leading the preparation and maintenance of Groveland Ice Rink. 
Ray's dedication provides a high quality outdoor ice surface for the outdoor skating enjoyment of hundreds of St. Paul residents every winter. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Did you hear that? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean for that to be. Okay, District 15. Yay! Okay. <laughs> Stephen Clift. Stephen, founder and executive director. Oh, I, I forgot to wait for the clap. Sorry, because I get all confused. Okay, we don't want to make him feel bad. Especially since he's the founder and executive director of eDemocracy.org, has dedicated his career to cultivating citizen participation through the use of online issues forums and digital social networks. Steve was instrumental in promoting and helping launch the Highland Park Neighborhood Forum as the first neighborhood based online forum in St. Paul. His work is expanding to other St. Paul neighborhoods and is helping connect and give voice to citizens or to residents citywide. Brian Hawes. For the past several years, Brian has coordinated a program run through our district council to take working computers and get them to deserving persons and organizations. He volunteers his time to staff, to staff our neighborhood cleanups and goes through the computer equipment that is dropped off to determine what is usable and what needs to be dismantled and recycled. The rest of the year, he takes in donated equipment and assembles working computers to donate. How great is that? Oh. I'm not sure about the pronunciation of this next one. Dennis Rose something, Rose Mark, I'm gonna say. Okay. I, as many of you know, De, uh, Dennis was Pat Harris's aide for many years, and so Dennis is just afraid that I won't stick to the script. And I'm not going to. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Okay, Dennis, besides being the Oh, besides being the number one legislative aide, and I apologize to all the rest of the Cracker Jack aides in the room. They're all very good. <laughs> but apparently they're not number one. Of course, they're all employed now. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Dennis is as well. We, I, can I just say we miss him terribly? Yes. Although Nicole rocks as well. So, uh, Dennis, besides being the number one legislative aide, is a deeply committed community member. He is one of the organizers for Serving Our Troops, the Shannon Open, a benefit for cystic fibrosis, and volunteers the, the St. Paul a Yellow Ribbon Initiative, Yellow Ribbon City Initiative, Boy Scout Troop 245, Lumen Christi Parish, and on top of it, shovels the sidewalks for his neighbors. He is the man behind the scenes, yet gives back to his community. Thanks for all you do. Aww. District 16, uh, Councilmember Tolbert. Oh no, it's Councilmember Thune, sorry. We're missing this person's okay, you ready? Yes, yep. District 16. Okay, I, sorry, I got distracted by Councilmember Thune. So yay, District 16. Okay. Uh, K, is it Rob? Rob. No, Rob, no, I should pronounce it correctly. Raba. Oh, geez, now i got to put the umlaut on it or something. Okay. <laughs> Kay provided excellent leadership as neighborhood communications coordinator during the planning stage for redevelopment of the old Wilder Foundation, Bush Memorial Children's Home site at 180 South Grotto Street. Over the past year and a half, Kay organized countless meetings and provided countless emails to ensure that all voices were heard and that the channel between developer, District 16, and nearby residents was always open. Her diligence, clarity, and fair-minded approach were just the best. Congrats. Chad Scally. Right, I know. And Chad, your, your paperwork is in the works. Oh. I know, I know. 
Well, I, I should have just gone like this. Look at that, Chad. Oh, wow. Yeah, look at that. Plain paper. Okay. Um, it, you, we'll get you a nice, fresh, off-the-printer copy. So you just stay right there and hear all the great work you've been doing. Um, Chad Scally. Chad has served and worked in the community for years, being actively involved on the District 16 Board and Environment Committee, and recently as president of the Grand Avenue Business Association. He provided leadership in installing bike racks along Grand Avenue, and currently is helping guide the new collaborative FROG, whatever that stands for. Rock. For Recycling on Grand. For Recycling on Grand. Not bad. To encourage, well, I mean, frog recycling, I don't quite get the connection, but it's a nice acronym. Encourage, educate businesses and the public to increase recycling along Grand Avenue. He also owns rental properties that incorporate green technologies. Congratulations. Yes, everyone does. And we have one left. One, uh, yep. And our, our last award is to Daria Orandi Lucas. <laughs> With a warm and subtle touch, Daria has helped improve the quality of life in our community. As a small business owner, owner of Baby Banu. 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 Okay, which means? Oh, lady in Persian. Oh, I love that. On Grand. Daria also makes the extra effort to help out the community by tutoring local middle school students and coordinating fundraising efforts for numerous charitable causes. Truly, we are blessed to have such a caring member of our community and look forward to many more years of her spirited service. A big hand to everybody. And congratulations. Okay, there you go. Let's give one more round of applause for all of our award winners tonight. That's all that we have for you tonight, folks. Thanks for coming.